Good evening, everyone. I'm Hubert Wiggins, and this is a special presentation from NBC 24. Tonight, we're going to share with you the story of Missions International of America, the charity created in 2002 by Jay and Jan Nielsen of Perrysburg. Twelve years ago, Dr. and Mrs. Nielsen decided that they wanted to work in Haiti. They sought the help of a Haitian person that they knew and trusted and asked him to find, in Jan Nielsen's words, the poorest, most desolate place he could find. The Nielsens were led to Savinet, Haiti, a small village of 2,000 people in the western part of the country. When they arrived, they saw a barren, desolate place. The nearest school was miles away. There was no access to clean water and no jobs. The Nielsens quickly realized that there was a lot of work to do. The first thing on their to-do list was to build a school. We believe that really education is the key. We want these people to be educated so that they can be the future of Haiti. With that vision in mind, the Nielsens built the first elementary school in the Sabinette. The Brad Reddick School opened in 2006. The K through 6th grade school is named after Brad Reddick, an early supporter of MIA, and a beloved member of the Perrysburg community who died at a young age from cancer in 2004. Over the years, Reddick's sons have made multiple visits to the Sabinette. It's just such an honor to come out here and be able to work worked for something that is named after my father. Education is one of Haiti's biggest challenges. Even though the Haitian constitution mandates that all citizens receive a free education, the government provides little funding. Most of the schools in Haiti charge fees that most people cannot pay. The dropout and literacy rate in Haiti are among the highest in the Western Hemisphere. When the Nielsens arrived in the Sabinette, they saw many children in the community, but no school. When the Brad Reddick School first opened, they offered kindergarten through second grade. The charity has earned enough financial backing from people in Northwest Ohio that class now goes up to the sixth grade. Since the school's founding, more than 2,000 students have graduated, and in June, 100% of the Brad Reddick School's sixth graders passed a national exam, one of just a handful of schools in the country to accomplish this feat. Tuition for the kids is all paid for by sponsors in the United States. For $100, it sponsors a child, buys his uniform, buys his books um, for that year. And then the, the kids pay a teeny little couple of dollars registration fee so that they have ownership. We want the families to have ownership in the education as well. Teachers from the Toledo area usually accompany the Nielsens in one of their week-long visits to the Savinette. One of them is Gina Hearing of Perrysburg. She has channeled her passion for teaching gifted students into creating an organization called a Gifted Generation. In November 2014, a select group of Brad Reddick students were inducted into the program. I, as a teacher of gifted children in the United States, could use my skills and abilities to help children in developing nations to have those same kind of opportunities um, as kids in the United States. Gina is one of dozens of Americans whose volunteer work in the Savinette has been a key factor in the charity's success here. In addition to working in the Brad Reddick School, volunteers have worked in the mission's medical clinic, organized construction projects, taught English, and farming techniques. All but one of the members of the 2014 trip have made multiple trips to the Savinette. I asked them why they keep coming back. I'm Karen Roman from Toledo, Ohio, and this is my seventh trip to Savinette. Why do you keep coming back? Every time I come back, I see a remarkable change in this community. And, and it was a wonderful community seven years ago when I first attended, and it was very Haitian, one of the poorest communities in all of Haiti. And Haiti's the, the poorest country in the world in the Western Hemisphere, and one of the poorest in the world. And what I've become aware of is the relationship that a mission group can create with the community by coming back. Karen volunteered at the clinic. Her assignment was to take patients' vitals before sending them inside to see the doctor. I'm Rich Krasnowski. I'm an optician, and I've been to the Savinette in Haiti. Uh, this will be my sixth trip. What I come back for, there's always anywhere from three to five instances where I'll put a pair of glasses on someone I've refracted and you get a look that you will never forget in your life of just joy. I mean, I've had people who've cried because, they, because of the vision that they've gained back. Some of Rich's inventory of prescription eyeglasses were donated by people in Northwest Ohio. 
My name is Carolyn Smith. I'm a pharmacist, and this is my fourth trip back to Haiti. Carolyn's job was to dispense medication to patients. I like to help the doctors here. I'm able to do what I went to school to for and help out the children and adults here. On each trip, Carolyn tries to take as many pictures as possible for the benefit of her friends and family back home. Is it difficult for people to comprehend the portrait that you portray about life here in the Savannah? Absolutely. They, uh, the people back home, they don't understand living without electricity, without running water, without uh, medicine, with, without insurance, without um, light, uh, a light on at night, without clocks, anything. The, the people back home, they don't understand the extreme poverty here. My pictures that I show them help enlighten them somewhat. And uh, a lot of my friends and coworkers just love to help out. Even if they can't be here physically, they are here in spirit. My name is Travis Nipple. I'm from Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and I've been living in Haiti for about four years. It's Jamie Nipple, and I'm from Finland slash Africa. I grew up in Africa, but I've been in Haiti for a little over a year, almost two years now. After the January 2010 earthquake that devastated Haiti's capital city, Port-au-Prince, Travis Nipple felt the need to go to Haiti and offer his electrical engineering expertise to help in reconstruction. Missions International of America, the Perrysburg-based charity founded by J.N. Jan Nielsen in 2002, was the first mission he gave assistance to. Over the past four years, some things seem to go really slowly, and then all of a sudden in the past year, it's just kind of exploded that now you can see the guest house all coming together and just the opportunity for this community to grow. Um, I think God can do some great things here if we let him. Since I last spoke to Travis in Haiti two and a half years ago, he met and married a young woman who grew up in Africa. We met in Pennsylvania, actually. I was volunteering for a nonprofit there for a year, and in my last month there, he happened to be visiting from Haiti, and we crossed paths, and he followed me back to Africa and proposed. It was quick. <laughs> Married mission life is difficult, but rewarding. Depends on the day. There's <laughs> days when it's like, I love this, and then there's days that it, it wears on you, but it definitely bonds you in a way that an easier life wouldn't. So. Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere and the third poorest in the world. Access to health care is limited to people who can pay. Twice a year, American doctors volunteer one week of their time to man the MIA clinic here in the Savonette. Dr. Sue Leatherman of Columbus led the medical team that operated the clinic on this most recent trip. On most trips, she is accompanied by a second American doctor, but not this time. She was the lone physician. Then to everyone's surprise, a local Haitian doctor showed up on the first day. I thought it was an answer from God, definitely. Well, because I've been very concerned about uh, being shorthanded and knowing that I alone would not be able to see all of the patients uh, that needed to be seen. And between the two of us this morning, we saw some very incredibly sick people. Several months ago, MIA co-founder Dr. Jay Nielsen had a chance encounter with Dr. Gaspar Edmund and invited him to help out with the clinic said to him that I really appreciate the work that he's doing for my Haitian people. And then I asked him, how can I involve, okay? MIA brings doctors and nurses to the Savonette twice a year in March and November. It's the only opportunity for most people here to see a physician. Like many people around get sick because most of them get blood, high blood pressure, intestinal problem and gastrointestinal problem, many different kind of sicknesses they have. After being examined by Dr. Edmund or Dr. Leatherman, the patient is given a prescription and then sent to the next room where they are greeted by pharmacist Carolyn Smith. Without tooting my own horn, I think I dispensed about as many prescriptions today as a typical Walmart or Rite Aid. But at the same time, uh, the patients um, uh, appreciate uh, the little bit of counseling I can give them. We do prepackage a lot of the medications and have them set up so that I can just give them a month's supply at a time. 
Each day for four consecutive days, people waited patiently in long lines under a blistering hot sun. For most, this was their one chance all year to see a physician. There were some people with long-standing illnesses that the doctors could not say. Uh, there are a couple of children that we have uh, a lot of concern about, yes. One we sent to the hospital, uh, and the other one I think is in very bad shape. Have you seen any critically ill people? Yes. How, 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 does it, how do you deal with that? You do your best. Just send them on their way. There were a few, a uh, couple that I know that Dr. Sue saved their life. Um, give them a whopping dose of antibiotic the first day. Sorry. <laughs> And uh, second day, the girl came back doing better, gave her another dose. Third day, we sent her home on PO. So I know if Dr. Sue wasn't there, she was critically ill. She probably had pneumonia. Carolyn said that there were some, there were some moments where you had to explain to parents that their children were in a very critical situation. How was that for you to have to do? Well, it's always difficult to uh, give bad news to people. There's no good way to do it, no easy way to do it. It's particularly hard in a cross-cultural setting through a translator in a busy room full of a lot of people. Uh, and I, I, you just have to be kind and gentle and patient, and, and it takes time. You have to allow people time if you're breaking you know. bad news to them. But even in the midst of tragedy, the team saw clear signs of progress amongst the villagers. A lot, fewer infections, uh, their skin much better. Uh, yeah, less, less yeast infections, um, very little cough this year, um, very little worm infections. Mm -hmm. I think the clean water has really been doing the trick because uh, and also there was no uh, chronic outbreak last year. We had what we thought was pertussis and there's, we haven't seen any of that. If you want to see the eye doctor, you've got to enter through the rear of the clinic. The line to see him is just as long as the one at the front to see the physicians. Quite frankly, I was surprised at the dozens of people who stood in line each day to see optician Rich Kruzanowski. The demand for his services were so great, I could not speak to him until the last day. It was great. Uh, I had a lot of good moments, had a lot of great dispensings where you get the little aha moment, you know, either a tear that they can see again or they're just the biggest smile that they can see. More than three dozen people left Rich's chair with new vision, thanks to prescription eyeglasses donated by people in Northwest Ohio. Uh, as far as glasses that we inventory, donated eyeglasses, that would probably have been about, let's see, 35 to 40 pair which is really good. Well, the larger the inventory, the more I have to pick from. Other than that, if I can't help them with that, I try and fit them with readers. At the end of the week, Rich was tired, but happy. Very gratifying. I mean, you just, you don't build your own self-esteem. You just feel very needed. You feel needed, and it's just a great, wonderful feeling. Dr. Leatherman says much good was done in four days. Well, I think we accomplished a lot of things under fairly difficult uh, circumstances. Um, we were uh, blessed with uh, having a Haitian doctor show up to uh, give us a hand with things that really increased the number of patients we would, uh, that we were able to see. You know, I have a wonderful pharmacist uh, who really helped with things. The Haitian uh, nurses pitched in and did a lot of work. So I think it's been well. I think that we were able to do a lot of good. Uh, there are some things that we can't do very much about, but there are things that uh, we can do small things that help a lot, and so I was very pleased that we were able to be useful. Dr. Leatherman and her team were able to see 440 patients over that four-day span. We're going to take a short break, but when we return, I'm going to introduce you to some outstanding young men of the Sabinette who are becoming leaders in their community. The Americans who volunteer in the Sabinette have inspired the young people there to expand their minds. A few men in particular have developed extraordinary leadership capabilities, and they have been rewarded with important responsibilities within the charity.
when Jay and Jan Nielsen bring what I oh okay I thought okay oh that has to be um, knowledge is power there you go my friends Ma Max and Charlie fan fan yeah The Americans who volunteer in the Sabinette have inspired the young people there to expand their minds. A few men in particular have developed extraordinary leadership capabilities and they have been rewarded with important responsibilities within the charity. When Jay and Jan Nielsen bring Americans with them to Haiti to volunteer at the MIA school, clinic and community garden, they rely on locals to translate. There was a time when it was difficult to find local people to translate. Reginald Burles decided to be a solution to that problem. The reason why I made a decision to learn English is because when the project first came here, I couldn't say even one word. And the doctor came, they need tra translators. Reginald has risen quickly up the ranks of the charity's leadership and on this past trip was appointed to the board of Missions International of America. The reason why Dr. J and Sister Jen uh, just chose me to be in, in the board is because first of all, I am very respectful and I am kind. I know how to treat people. One of the biggest projects is the community garden 28-year-old Moise Bateau oversees a crew of 15 men responsible for the planting and cultivation of crops that will very soon be a source of food for the community. It is very important when you make a garden here. It can help you because, you know, Haiti uh, needs a lot of help, lack of food, a lot of things. I think this is very important to plant the vegetables garden. Moise is another of the locals that the Nielsens have come to rely on to keep things in check when they are not in Haiti. He makes me uh, organize a garden here uh, because uh, he knows I'm a, I am an agronomist. That's why uh, he just put me to conduct uh, the other people. He just put me together with them to work with them. He said I'm very important. Uh, the reason I uh, have him to solve a lot of problems. Moise's problem-solving acumen became evident minutes after our interview began. Just a few feet away from where we were standing, a disagreement between two workers quickly escalated into a fight. Moise intervened and tensions were cool. 21-year-old Juvens Labanade played a very important role as a translator in the clinic. First, uh, it is a, a great pleasure for me to, um, to bring my collaboration to the people. Um, um, if I was not there, many people um, would not be able to talk to the doctors that are uh, very, very, very sick. And um, it is a privilege for me. During my three visits to Sabinet, Haiti over the past 30 months, I've had thousands of conversations with hundreds of people, and they all tell me the same thing, that life in Haiti is very hard, but thanks to the work of Missions International of America, they see a brighter future. Within the first minutes of my arrival in the Savinet on my first trip in March 2012, I met then 19-year-old Maxon Romain. He was one of the few Haitians in the Savinet who spoke English, and we became instant friends. In that first trip, the Haitians could not understand why I did not speak Creole since I looked just like them. And so Maxon became my unofficial translator that first trip. Last year, Maxon's English speaking skills earned him a coveted translator position in MIA. The money he earns, he uses to pay the tuition fees for him and his brothers. 
that's why I'm very uh, interesting about education because I know when I am educated, uh, my life w will be better uh, than I am right now because education is the key. For Maxon and his brothers, 19-year-old Charlie and 17-year-old Fan Fan, the struggle to pay for their high school education is just one part of the battle. Even when they finish, job prospects are bleak. I asked Charlie what kind of profession he would like to have when he graduates. Maxon translated. He says that um, about learning a profession, um, it would be very important to him. But most of the time uh, um, in Haiti, when you are done with school, when you are getting work, and you don't have money to go uh, uh, to to get a profession that you really like, uh, that's why right now they obliged to take any kind of um, uh, 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 profession that even though they don't really appreciate it. The youngest in Maxon's family is 17-year-old Fan Fan. On this trip, I did not need Maxon to translate our conversations. I still remember my first interaction with Fan Fan two and a half years ago. His first words to me in English were, do you love Jesus? Like his older brothers, Fan Fan has a passion for learning. For me, it's a pleasure today to talk about education. And education is something very important. Even if you, you are in Haiti, if you don't have education, you, I can say you don't, you don't represent nothing in this society. The Romain brothers are grateful for the opportunities that they have received from MIA to earn the little bit of money that pays their tuition and book fees. They are not sure what the future holds for them, but they are hopeful. When you have education, you hope something. B because since you are learning, so you, you have in your mind to have a changing life. You know Jensen? One of Dr. and Mrs. Nielsen's primary objectives is to teach the Haitians how to provide for themselves. One of the projects under construction right now is a farm resource center that aims to bring dozens of jobs to the Savonette. The farm resource center is a project several years in the making. On my first trip to the Savonette in March of 2012, the five-acre plot of land across the street from the Brad Reddick School was nothing but rocks and shrubs. The first phase of construction that year entailed workers clearing the field. Dr. Nielsen's vision was for a compound to be built on this land with used shipping containers. The first container was dropped last June. It was a moment of celebration. Push it! With just that one shipping container unloaded, Dr. Nielsen knew exactly what he wanted the compound to look like. Well, the center section, as you see here, is a 108 by 58 foot conference center, and the other side is going to be 38 Haitian administrative guest beds and 72 dormitory beds so that we can bring people in for farm conferences and teach them. Then came a major setback when the Nielsen's discovered their most trusted Haitian worker was trying to sabotage the project. It's heartbreaking. Um, when you do a project like this, you have to trust the people that you hire. And the man that was in charge of our organization um, turned out not to be trustworthy, but it will not stop the work. Undaunted by that betrayal, the Nielsen's persevered. It's taken me six years to teach them um, how to stay working, to be honest, um, found the people who don't work so well and, and moved on and found better men. But this week, you've seen every man working as hard as they can. It's like watching the pyramids be built. Now a dozen shipping containers are in place, and Dr. Nielsen's vision is ever closer to being realized. We have a conference center here on the right-hand side mm -hmm. that is capable of seating 166 people, maintaining a dance floor and a stage with projection and a sound booth mm -hmm. so that we can hold conferences, uh, retreats, and uh, weddings. All of that, the purpose is simply to create work for this community so that they can sell food and they can wash dishes and they can have jobs. On the opposite side, there will be another circle of containers that will be somewhat for administrative staff and somewhat for the visiting professors and teachers 
that are here. And then, of course, behind the compound is an acre of land where we will have our tilapia aquaponics program. And then as we move to the front, we see the remainder of this five acres, which is going to be the research gardens, teaching gardens, production facilities, and then across the road, two and a half more acres of agroforestry and tree production. The goal is to hold the first agricultural seminar next June. Haiti's agricultural minister has pledged his support. Some people are already earning income working in the farms right now. Others will earn a salary by selling some of the products at market. More will earn money by teaching the seminars on a regular basis. But the work that the mission is doing in the desert is beginning to get noticed. On the last full day of the trip, a stranger showed up at the MIA compound. Andy Romer. Well, out of nowhere, he showed up in my compound today and brought me a wonderful gift. He has been giving all over Haiti a device that creates chlorine out of simple rock salt and uh, the leads to a 12-volt battery off of an automobile and makes a lot of it very fast so we can give it away free in the community. Andy and his wife, who are originally from Kentucky, have been working in Haiti for three years. A mutual friend told him about MIA. And uh, the very first time that you stepped foot on Haitian soil, what, was your, what were your impressions? Dear God, I've landed in hell. That's what my first impression was when I left the airport and was driven and given a ride through Port-au-Prince. And the few minutes that you've been on the compound, what are your impressions of this operation here? I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> it's wonderful. I'm overwhelmed because there's just a, a, a massive amount of love that's been flowing forth from this place and it, uh, it's there's just not enough of this kind of work being done in Haiti, and we just want to share it as much as possible. I hope you enjoyed this special presentation from NBC 24 News. To see some of my other Haiti stories, please go to our website, NBC24.com. And to learn more about Missions International of America, visit their website, MissionsInternationalOfAmerica.com. I'm Hubert Wiggins. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.